thanks very much for coming and for having me here. Um, I'm looking forward to the discussion that we have after I, I talk for a while. Uh, Mark asked me to speak for about 50 or 60 minutes, so just to get you prepared for that, that's, that's, that's about how long I'll probably be talking. And then again, I look forward to the back and forth. Uh, a, lo a lot of what I'll be doing today is talking about what structural racism is because we have to know what it is in order to dismantle it. Um, so that's going to be my orientation here. Um, so I'll be offering a, a structural con conception of racism and this can be contrasted with very ordinary conventional ways that we tend to think about racism. Maybe not every people in this room Maybe, but maybe so, but certainly in the, in the media um, and sort of everyday ordinary conversation. And my observation in listening to newscasts regarding, you know, Trayvon Martin or Renisha McBride or Michael Brown or um, Donald Siegel or anyone like this is that we tend to fixate on individuals when we think about racism and we focus on attitudes and behavior of individuals. Okay, Now th this creates sort of a disconnect because people who study racism and people who organize against racism have a very different c conception in general of what racism is and generally the conception is not this doesn't have a focus exclusively on the individual and attitudes and behavior. Um, the, there's, there's a, is, I, I, Mark put it well in the advertisement for this, there's a, there's a systemic focus when people are thinking about racism. Um, there's an effort, there's a, not just an effort, but a, a, a need and a requirement to um, disengage ourselves from thinking about individuals and thinking more in, in systemic terms. Um, and thinking about power and inequality and subordination that's linked to racial categorization in interlocking institutions and processes that unfold over time. And the overtime part, I think, is really, really, really important. Okay, so I'll be, I'll be emphasizing that overtime aspect. Uh, now's a good time to give you a little background on myself. I'm a, I'm a sociologist of race, I'm also a historical sociologist, and I'm a political sociologist, and that's where I enter this conversation. And it's, these, it's thinking in some systemic terms in processes unfolding over time that is, is sort of the most important, is what I argue here. Um, now, when somebody says something one, some, when somebody of one racial group says something bad about somebody from another racial group, okay, it's not insignificant. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that. But if we don't treat these actions in systemic terms, then we sort of, we miss the power, the power relations that are going into this, okay. Um, When we have individual-centered conceptions of racism, when we, when we employ these, as happens in the media and so on, what actually ends up happening is we give a lot of attention to racism, what we call racism, but in the very process of giving it a lot of attention, it has the ironic effect of marginalizing racism as, as it's in its systemic forms. Okay? So, when we talk about Donald Sterling and what he said and didn't say and got caught on the tape saying and so on, what we have done is we've, we, we, we tend to create this idea that that's somehow, we've identified that's racism, that's clearly out of the norm, most people don't get caught on the tape saying things like that, and then, and therefore, we, as a consequence, marginalize racism as a system, okay? So when I say system, I, want, I guess I want to disassociate it. Um, for better or for worse, I'm an academic, so I want to disassociate it a little bit from, if you think system, you might think of leftist political rhetoric from the 60s, and I think that's, that's good and useful and so on, but that's not really what I mean by systemic. What I mean by systemic is that there are a set of interlocking variables that mutually reinforce each other 
and, and stay together over time. That we can't isolate one, one variable or one institution or one process and say that's racism or that's the solution to racial inequality. Okay? When I think of uh, really good examples just getting beyond racism and just thinking about racial inequality, a very non-systemic approach to racial inequality is to just focus on education which is what we, it, you know, to the degree that anyone agrees on anything in the United States is that education is, can be the solution to the problems of racial inequality. This is a very non-systemic view because it fails to situate education in a set of many other institutions, including neighborhoods and economic forces and unemployment and poverty. Education is, is ripped out of that context and it's, it's portrayed as the teacher as the solution, the principal as the solution, just for example, okay? Um, racism as a system. Well, we can think of other systems. Capitalism as a system. Socialism as a system. These isms, there's something centric. And racism when it, as a system has to do with race being central to social processes, just as capitalism has to do with private ownership and capital being central to social processes. Okay. Now, when, when you live in a capitalist society, we call people, people get called socialists specifically because they're supposedly breaking with norms, right? Or if you're in a socialist society, people get called capitalists because they're breaking with norms. This is what I'm trying to argue about calling individuals racist and what it does and identifying individual racism, is it then suggests that the system, the overall context, is actually non-racist. So we're, we're trying to um, um, rebuke somebody or correct their behavior or whatever, but, over, it, but in the very process of doing so, we're, we're perpetuating the myth that the overall system is not characterized by racial inequality. Okay, so. To dismantle structural racism, we have to identify it. And you know, this, isn't, this, isn't, this is no small matter because we not only have to identif identify it, but we have to win the struggle over the definition of the situation. Because right now the definition of the situation is that racism is an individual matter. And it comes out of prejudices and behaviors and it's anomalous. So, can we call individual level racism racism? Of course, but um, just in terms of winning this battle over the definition of the situation, I think we should generally insist on modifiers like institutional and structural racism, which are themselves uh, structural types. Okay, so I just got done saying that individual attitudes and behavior, I, I was trying to marginalize those in the an analysis of racism, but they really can't be marginalized. What they need to be, do what needs to be done is they need to be situated in systemic terms. And that's what we don't tend to do, is we don't situate race, you know, um, attitudes and behavior related to race and racial inequality in systemic terms. For example, in systemic terms, it matters a great deal, a great deal, that whites have tended to see black, their black neighbors as threats to property values. That matters a great deal. It's just, it's just a basic numbers game. In a context where, in, in context of markets where demand creates value, it's, it's really important that a group that outnumbers another group by five or six or seven to one or eight to one holds these attitudes because that's going to have very strong effects on the values of property and homes. And it's something I'm really going to be sort of honing in on here. In systemic terms, it matters a great deal that a majority of whites in a country where whites are still a very large majority think that the best explanation for black socioeconomic inequality is a lack of willpower. That matters a great deal. Those are the kinds of attitudes that really matter. But to talk about them, they need to be talked about in systemic terms. Rarely do you hear anyone talking about this survey data, for example. This sur I'm actually talking about survey data here, the second element. The surveys, the uh, general social survey has been asking this question since 1977. 
and they've asked it as recently as 2008. So going all the way back to just a, just a decade after the civil rights transformation, asking whites, why is it that African Americans are relatively low on the socioeconomic ladder? And the answer consistently over time, the most prominent answer has been because they lack willpower. This matters in a democracy when whites are the majority. It's gone from 65 to 51 percent, it's still a majority. And no other explanation has ever bested it. Okay, so in both these cases, the systemic significance of attitudes and the behavior that comes out of attitudes sometimes enters because whites have greater economic and political power in the context of markets and in the context of democracy. That's just, that's just a fact in terms of pure numbers, but it's also a fact on, in the markets area in terms of actual wealth. Okay. So let's let me. So when we're talking about structural racism, um, effects really matter, right? We're, we're we're moving away from worrying about intentions and whether somebody directly discriminated against somebody else, and we're looking at outcomes. And the outcomes today are a series of measures that show us that there's pervasive socioeconomic inequality right now, here and now. Okay. So what I have here is um, basically a, a black down, breakdown of white black. It's, it's non-Hispanic white. So that's always important to separate out. Um, poverty rates, African American poverty rates are nearly three times as great as white poverty rates. This is actually as low as it's ever been. So you know there is some progress, but when as low as it's ever been is almost three times as much. That's not a great deal to celebrate. So these, this right-hand column ratios, I'll be using this quite a bit. Okay, if we look at unemployment rates, African-American unemployment rate twice as much. Okay, and this is something, this is sort of a long-term trend. We can go back to the 60s. African-American unemployment continues to be about twice as much as white unemployment. As I'll show you briefly on the next slide, education is not what's driving this. Okay. It makes sense that if your poverty rates are higher and unemployment rates are higher, that your household median income is gonna be lower. And it's quite a bit lower for African Americans. And now these last four elements are what I'm really honing in on here. You know, you can look, talk about structural racism and go into a lot of different areas. I'm gonna focus, I'm gonna to try to go deeply here with homes and neighborhoods and the wealth that come out of them. Okay, and one of the most important facts here is that the home ownership rate for whites is just a great deal more. Okay, 73% versus about 43%. Among those who own homes, white homes are of 50% greater value on the median, the most recent data I was able to find. Okay, more than $40,000. All of this, of course, plays into measures of wealth. Okay, and when we move from income into measures of wealth, the ratios explode. Okay, and some of the most, um, the newest line of research on inequality among sociologists and also economists is emphasizing wealth. Wealth is the big story here and we need to shift away from income and think about wealth and wealth inequalities and the way they accumulate over time. We can see that median net worth in 2010 Basically, as Thomas Shapiro, who's done a lot of work on this, and Mel Melvin Oliver like to say, for every dollar of white wealth, African Americans have a nickel. Okay, so nearly 20 times difference. And then when you take away home wealth, even though African Americans have lower home ownership rates, it's their most important form of wealth, and then things just absolutely explode from there. Okay, now what I'm going to be doing now is looking at some of this inequality over time, but also making some comparisons in a single time between whites and blacks at different uh, levels of the socioeconomic ladder. What I'm gonna just show again and again is that African Americans with more education have a harder time getting a job than whites with lower education. That African Americans with more money have harder time getting in neighborhoods with low poverty rates than whites with low amounts of money. 
And all this has really strong effects on wealth, has strong effects on inequality. Okay? So let me start with unemployment, because you look at that last unemployment the, the few times and you think, well, what does that have to do with education? Okay? And I'm trying to sort of color code this a little bit. We have the African-American employment rate and the, the white employment, unemployment rate, 2011. You know, it's overall two, two times difference. African-Americans get some college and associate's degree, and when they do that, according to this data, they finally reach levels of unemployment that are, well, not quite there, but almost as low as whites with less than a high school diploma. Okay, and clearly not nearly as low as high school graduates. Right? High school, um, African Americans with some college have more than a 50% higher rate of unemployment than, than high school graduates who are white. Okay? Same for African Americans with a bachelor's degree. By getting that bachelor's degree, they're still you know, nearly 60% higher, on, they still have nearly 60% higher unemployment rates than whites with a bachelor's degree, but they still have also un unemployment rates comparable to whites with some college or an associate's degree. Now, what I'm about to show you here goes back in time. It actually does a nice comparison of students that I teach now at Pitt, say, or in any universities around the country, their sort of generation and the generation of the civil rights movement. Okay? So we're looking at who's born in different periods, and we're looking at the poverty levels of their neighborhood, which of course is important for many things. Poverty is a stressor for people. When your neighbors are in poverty, they're stressed out. Poverty is a, a, a drag on home values. Poverty is a drag on property tax-based school funding. Right? It's an important measure. I've sorted it just by green for the early period and blue for the later period. And this is from Patrick Sharkey's fairly recent book, um, appropriately, call, appropriately called Stuck in Place. And I you know, strongly recommend it, recommend it um, for a, a range of data. The story, if we focus in on these two rows here, is one of stagnation and in continued levels of very, very high inequality. When we think of structure, you know, we can think of this as a structure, a building. Right? You build it and it stays there unless somebody does otherwise for quite a long time, does something to counter its existence. Okay? And we've done very little to counter the existence of this level of inequality. So African Americans born in the civil rights generation, 64% of them were in poverty neighborhoods of at least 20%. Fast forward all the way to well after the civil rights era, and it's the number 66%. Whites continue to enjoy incredible advantages in the neighborhoods in which they're born and raised. Okay, such that in this most recent generation, the ratio is 11 to 1, the ratio of poverty, if we take that 20% or more. So it's a structure. It was put in place. We've done very little to counter it, and so it keeps existing. Okay? It doesn't need negative attitudes to exist. It doesn't need people to say racist things. It's just as long as we don't dismantle the structure, it's going to continue to continue. Um, be there. Okay, now I'm going to go back in time, back in time to that 1955 to 70 period, although more around 1970. Okay, this is right after neighborhoods were racialized for decades, especially all over the country, but in the North is, is most notable because there was no Jim Crow system in the North. And here I want to do a contrast, like I said, between African Americans who are better off in some ways socioeconomically and whites who are worse off socioeconomically and how much better the neighborhoods for whites who are worse off are. Thanks, and this is thanks very much to racial segregation. Okay. 1970, before we even get into this, you know, 1970, the, the measure of segregation on the national level is much higher in other places. <laughs> 
was about 79, 79%. It's called the dissimilarity index. What that means is for neighborhoods to be integrated, four out of five whites or blacks would have had to move. So this is a highly segregated context. One consequence of these high levels of segregation is that African Americans who were not in poverty, not below the poverty line, were far more likely to live in low income areas as defined by the census, basically poverty areas, than were whites who were actually in poverty. Okay, so they had a, a series of reports and I just sort of just went through some of the city reports and, and, and compiled them. And you can see Pittsburgh there. Pittsburgh is actually one of the more dramatic numbers. If you were African American in Pittsburgh in 1970 and you weren't in poverty, you were twice as, more than twice as likely to live in a low income area than a white who was in poverty. Okay, this is systematic white advantage. This is a structure put in place that has, unfold, has unraveled a little bit, but not very much over time. Okay? Here's another measure, you know, thinking of the suburbs. One of the, one of the approaches that we social scientists take often to figure out whether there's discrimination taking place is to control for social class, control for income, right? And there's a lot of merit in it. Um, of course, it doesn't obviously take into account the historical process that created the differences in income, but we control for it. Let's look at what happened around 1972 in terms of patterns of living based on income. Okay. Now, what we have here is obviously, you know, we have total family income, and then we have the percent of whites by those incomes who are living in the suburbs and the percent of African Americans by those incomes living, living in the suburbs. You go down each row, the whites and the African Americans, and you can see it makes sense. The more money you have, the more likely you are to live in the suburbs. The more money, and that's true for African Americans as well. The reason I have the two cells, let me see if I got, yeah. Okay, the reason I have the two cells in yellow, I think is, is probably pretty clear. The wealthiest African Americans were not nearly as likely to live in the suburbs as the poorest whites. And this is among all whites and African Americans living in metropolitan areas. Okay, a system of advantage and disadvantage was laid down. Now, let's get, let's up to, let's get things up to date a little bit, looking at the period from roughly 1990 to 2010, the data stop in 2007, okay, using the American Community Survey. Once again, um, it, it might be a little hard for you to see, but there's some ca you can see the categories, poor, middle, and affluent, right? broken down by income. I don't want to say class, because class also includes wealth. But just by income, poor, middle, and affluent. So a poor person in this data is less than 175% of the poverty level, in case you can't see the, the text down there. And an affluent person is more than 350% of the poverty level, level, and middle income is somewhere in between. This is very recent, of course. This is 1990 to basically 2010. Like, once again, I have rows highlighted under black and white to show the advantage that poorer whites have over wealthier blacks. <laughs> it's basically the gist of this in terms of their ability to get into neighborhoods that have lower poverty levels. So the blue and the, the blue controls for it has the black middle class compared to white poor whites. Okay, the blue. And you can see systematically across time, it's much easier for poor whites to get into the lower poverty neighborhoods than middle income blacks. At the same time, affluent blacks, the green compared to middle income whites, they can't get into Poverty, low poverty neighborhoods to the same degree that middle income whites can. Now, I wasn't fancy enough to, to capture the fact that I actually could have colored the poor white row also green to compare it to affluent blacks. Because if we take a look at 2007 affluent African Americans, their average poverty level of their neighborhood is actually greater than low income whites. Okay, and all this matters for, you know, 
to schools, the property taxes, the, the, the wealth of where you live, the, the, the value of your home. Okay, going back, remembering in 2000 that the median home value for African Americans, $80,000. The median home value for whites, $123,000. This gives you a look at the same sort of data um, for different cities, just to see some variation. The overall ratio of affluent African Americans to middle income whites is 1.28. What this means is the poverty level of affluent African Americans is 20, 28% higher, their neighborhoods poverty level is 28% higher than middle income whites. Of course, there are many cities where the ratio is much higher than 1.28, okay? And some of these culprits, for those who are familiar with the history of race in the North in the post-World War II period are not gonna be very surprising, like Milwaukee, like Newark, New Jersey, Okay, and remember, this is comparing affluent African Americans' poverty, not neighborhood poverty levels, to, to uh, the average white. Okay, and you can see Pittsburgh down here, neck and neck with Birmingham, Alabama. So, James Carville said that, you know, there was Pittsburgh and Philly and Bir Alabama in between, but actually Pittsburgh and Birmingham are right together here, side by side. Okay, now let's go back in time a little bit now and try to understand where does all this inequality come from, the, the inequality from the, the 1970 period, the most, most recent inequality, again focusing on housing and neighborhoods. Um, just curious, how many have heard of blockbusting? I imagine blockbusting, okay, give you a sense, maybe. Okay, well, here's an advertisement that captures it very well from a Kansas City newspaper. Using, the, of course, the language of, it, of its time. Colored in your block? Want to sell and get all cash for prompt appraisal estimate? Call Bill Williams. Get, the, get Bill Williams' phone number there. And you know he's with Chaz Curry Realtors. Okay. This is a process, what basically blockbusting, for those who aren't familiar with it, was a process whereby neighborhoods were turned over especially to the profit of real estate agents, some who intended and engineered it, and some who probably wished for something else. You know, the intentions don't really matter. What happened systematically was, as African Americans moved into neighborhoods, whites moved out, sometimes with very strong incentives to do so, or persuasion, and then the neighborhoods turned over. Okay, now, now we're in the, the realm of prejudice and discrimination. Right? We're sort of at that individual level. But there's a whole systemic part to this right? that, has, had, that has effects still today. But so let's go a little bit into the systemic. Why would a white person respond to this? You know, I think the classic response, the, the classic answer to that is, well, that was the 1950s and whites were racist. And they, they had negative attitudes towards African Americans, so of course they responded to this. Okay, and then, now we're in the post-civil rights era, and that, thankfully that's sort of gone away, and it's gotten much less, and so we don't have to worry about this. Okay, but somebody who was white in this time period, what I want to point out here, didn't have to have anti-black attitudes to respond to this advertisement. Because of the federal government, the real estate industry, the banking industry, all of these things lined up people's behavior, white's behavior, to respond to this kind of advertisement and sell quickly and get out. So what's the social context for this? Federal government policies, first and foremost, we should, you know, we should highlight. The federal government in 1955 is most known for not doing anything really about the Jim Crow South. I mean, if you could think, what, what was the policy of the federal government when it came to race that's most well known? Well, it wasn't doing really anything at this point in time about systematic legal exclusion in the South. Okay, there was the Supreme Court decision and a few, but they weren't being enforced. The federal government was doing nothing. But it was busy doing other things in the North, and it had been for some time. <clears throat> Between 1940 and 1970, Homeownership in the U.S. exploded. 
okay, from 44% home ownership to 64% in those three decades. After it's never really been very high prior to that. This was, I don't, we always need to be cautious, a direct result. This was to a large degree driven by federal government policies promoting home ownership. Okay, the most important of which being Federal Housing Authority loans, FHA, and then after starting in 1944 with the VA loans, that basically made home ownership possible for people. So this was a great policy. You know, it made it, made it possible for people for this reason. What was discovered in the Depression, okay, so go back to the 1930s, was the only people who can really buy a home and keep it are those who already have a lot of money, who already have a lot of wealth, not just a lot of income, but have accumulated a lot of wealth. This was because banks would only provide loans for two to 11 years, an average of five years. The loans, when you were done after five years, you didn't own your home. Who could, who could have paid that much over five years anyway? You just had to get your mortgage renewed and then you could stay in your home and, and so on. Well, of course, in the context of the Great Depression, when credit freezes up, home foreclosures um, happen all across the country because banks are not renewing these five-year mortgages. In steps the federal government to save this problem. It's not just a problem for home ownership. It's a problem for the home building industry. It's a problem. There's a, obviously a huge unemployment problem. So a series of policies are put in place that basically say the federal government is going to sell insurance to homeowners, prospective homeowners, take that money, and they're going to make banks' loans basically risk-free. Okay? They're going to make their loans basically risk-free because if the person defaults on the loan, the federal government will pay off the loan with the insurance money that it's collected from all these, the FHA insurance. Okay, that all sounds very good. I mean, depending on, you know, maybe some people would think it sounds bad, but it was really, really promotive of home ownership because it basically meant you didn't have to be a wealthy person to own your own home or you didn't have to live out in the, you know, way out in the country where there was no competition for land. You could actually live near cities and own a home. Okay. The problem with this was from the perspective of systematic racial inequality, was the federal government, it didn't invent ideas about how to do this, but it adopted ideas from the real estate industries, what the real estate industry was already doing. And this idea was you cannot, you, neighborhoods that are integrated racially are not gonna last. Home values will drop, so we are, we are not going, so basically the federal government would not um, insure loans in integrating neighborhoods. To put it another way, the federal government from the 1930s to the 1940s and fading in the 1950s subsidized racial segregation. It paid for it, basically, by channeling all the money into homogenous neighborhoods. Now, African Americans in homogenous neighborhoods could maybe get a loan, but it was so much harder because the racialized class structure you don't have the same wealth in the, in the overall community to support homogenous neighborhoods as you did in the white community, right? So federal government subsidizes segregation. Now, it's always nice to have exact figures, I think, or some, some sort of figure. So the Civil Rights Commission in the early 60s, you know, did a report on this. And they said, they, they came up with a figure from the 1940s to the late 1950s non-whites, so now we're including anyone who's not white, obviously, got less than 2% of FHA loans, less than 2% of FHA loans, okay? Probably they started to get some because there were some wealthy parts, that, uh, homogenous parts that were African-American, probably had something to do with the, the federal government did back away from this subsidizing segregation policy in the 50s, but it was less than 2%. Now, this needs to be put in perspective. Let's, let's really control for class now because this is really important to con control for class the other way around. African Americans at the time were about 12% of the population. 
okay, so let's just say that they were all the non-whites who got the FHA loans. So less than 2% of them got the FHA loans, of the loans went to them, right? So there's a ratio of six. They should have gotten six times more of the loans if we just do strict comparisons. That's already a lot, okay? It's already a lot of wealth that never went into the African-American community, never went into African-American families to be handed down over generations. Never happened, okay? But one has to take into account the fact who the FHA was for. It was for low, lower to moderate income people. So if anything, African Americans should have had, if there, if there wasn't a racial bias to it, they should have had well more than 12% of the loans, okay? It shouldn't have matched their population. So now we're talking about ratios of seven, eight, nine, you know, we don't know exactly what it is, but it's much higher than that. Federal government policies. Lay down the grid, basically, of structural racism in neighborhoods and in wealth, wealth inequalities. Um, okay, well, there's obviously also the practice of the real estate and banking industries, right? Um, it's not like the, the banks were putting up a fuss or anything. As I said, they were the ones who originally uh, invented this logic of not allowing racial integration, but the federal government systematized it. Mm. I would also add, you know, we can add a lot, but one, one thing to add is what happened then to African Americans who could not get federally insured loans, okay? And here, I mean, already you're not able to get a loan, so somebody who doesn't have a lot of money is just cut out of home, home ownership. They can't buy the home, it can't appreciate, they can't pass it on to their children, that's already done, okay? But e those who had money, in some ways could be, I don't know, if you maybe don't want to say worse off, but they could have a lot, they had the chance of having a lot more wealth taking away, taken away from them. With the federal government role in the, in the market, there was a lot of protection for people insured by FHA. They had their mortgage, they had their deed and so on, and it's, a, it's more of a laborious process for, for a foreclosure to happen. Without this option, African Americans with wealth had to do things, had to seek homes by buying on contract. Okay, basically taking out loans where a lot of times they were presented as, hey, you're gonna own your own home, make your down payment, make this payment every month, and you own your own home. The difference was that there really was no legal protection for African Americans in that situation. So if somebody lost their job, for example, which was very likely to happen, well, we see that the unemployment rates are two times as high, but gosh, going back then, it was so much easier to lose your job, okay? You lose your job and you can't make your payment. What you'd soon found out in those situations was you, you not only weren't gonna keep your home, but all the money that you'd put into it is gone, transferred transferred from you to some um, real estate person, real estate company, usually. Okay, so this is, you know, typical. This is what happens when people can't get secure financing. New markets emerge. They're often a lot more exploitative. This is the same thing that happened. Okay, now let's bring in white attitudes and behavior. Okay, now that we have the systemic context, let's understand a little bit more why they would respond this way. Respond to that advertisement. Okay, and you know, probably I'm not a homeowner myself. Maybe some of you probably are, maybe a lot of you. So you probably understand this better than I do to some degree in terms of a lived experience. Um, the simple logic is if you're living in an integrating neighborhood at this point in time, if, you ha if you're a white person and African Americans are moving into your neighborhood, it doesn't matter what your attitudes are. Because if the banks aren't gonna put money into your neighborhood, your neighborhood is gonna decline. Because demand for the houses in your neighborhood are gonna go down. Because most people can't afford to just buy a house with cash. So if the FHA and the VA and the banks and so on say, okay, here's this neighborhood, it's now integrating, no more capital is flowing in there, no more loans, then that neighborhood is gonna decline. For the simple reason, if, you want to, if somebody wants to sell their house, who are they gonna sell it to if nobody can get a loan to buy it? Okay? So this, these systemic aspects created a rational behavior to get out of there. 
Okay? It doesn't mean it was good or, or laudable or anything like that, but it was certainly rational. And it was systemically driven uh, by federal government policies in the real estate industry. All right, this was actually well described, what happened, how this process worked of neighborhoods turning over that were integrating. So I'm just going to use Anthony Downs' description. This is from 1981. So he's still talking about it, you know. This is obviously uh, 13 years after the Fair Housing Act. Um, you can continue to see this later, as, as I'll discuss. Um, but here's basically the logic, right? So there's racial, racial cha change occurred in the neighborhoods, right? They turned over systematically in cities from white to black because of the logic I just tried to lay out, in addition to probably prejudice and so on and so forth, right? Absolutely. So it happens so, so often, whites start thinking, well, this is inevitable. And, you know, this is the post-era when this is supposed to be illegal. But these things don't just die. Ideas like this don't die. Parents don't stop telling their children these ideas just because somebody passed a law. And this continues to have effects on wealth accumulation and inequality. So they think this is going to happen. They think their property values are going to fall. Well, for, for quite a while, they were, I mean, what, it wasn't just a thought. It was actually true, underwritten by the federal government. <laughs> and then here is where maybe I would part with Don's a little bit. They do occur, and the property values often de decline. But then he wants to go to white behavior and white attitudes. And there's some logic to this, right? Because middle-income households who were white then refused to enter the neighborhood. Prior to that time in the 40s, 50s, 60s, they probably couldn't enter the neighborhood because they couldn't get loans to do so. And so then the neighborhood declines. This is a numbers game, right? This is just, this is plain and simple. You know, there are five, five, six, seven, depending on what city you're in, right? Four, five, six, seven times as many whites as African Americans. The demand is driven largely by whites. So if they refuse to get into a neighborhood, Demand has dropped, price has dropped, value has dropped, right? So in, independent of anything else. Um, and then when you, when you factor in the fact that whites are also have more income, then it's, it's multiplied. So, you know, Downs concludes, well, this is sort of perverse because whites are attributing the bl a black entry into the neighborhood. They're saying what, what, the, what happens from that is the neighborhood declines, but the reason the neighborhood declines, Down says, is because whites believe it's going to decline and then they refuse to get into it. Right? So it's, they're, they're, in a sense, blaming the victim. I think it's a nice description of the process that has been well described for cities all over the place. What I don't like about it is it loses the systemic and historical elements. Okay? Again, because these ideas don't just go away because some laws change. So in that context, I guess I would say a few things, a couple things at least. First, there's just outright exclusion. As late as 1977, you know, it dipped down a bit. It used to be a majority. As late as 1977, there was a question asked in the general, general survey, social survey, white people have the right to keep Negroes, because that was the term, out of their neighborhoods, and Negroes should respect that right. Okay. The right to keep, keep them out of whites' neighborhoods. 42% of whites agreed with that in 1977, you know, or a decade after the Fair Housing Act. When you take into account the fact that 42% of whites, and these are, this is the numbers game that we should, I think we, should, we need to stay focused on when we think about these things, 42% of whites vastly outnumbers 100% of African Americans. Okay. There's another question about whether whites, whether they would want to live in only all white neighborhoods or mostly white neighborhoods. Now we can go all the way to 1994. 1994 and almost half of whites say that they want to live in either all white neighborhoods or mostly white neighborhoods? Okay, these things don't just go away just because the federal government says, okay, well, we're, we're not going to allow discrimination anymore. A process is put in place and, and it remains there if it's not going to be reversed. 
Okay. So, you know, what I'm talking about here is long running white intergenerational advantage, speaking specifically of home ownership, but also the way that neighborhoods tie into schools, um, tie into employment opportunities, public transportation, every, where you live determines so many different things. So Thomas Shapiro has done a lot of work on this, looked at this panel study of income dynamics. And basically, this, this was looking at first-time home buyers. Now we're into the early 1990s, the same time that whites are saying, nearly half of them are saying they want all white or mostly white neighborhoods still. There's that going on for, for African-American home values, right? If you have half of the white population that won't value your neighborhood, that's pretty bad for the home values. There's also this going on. And this is really unseen and untalked about and doesn't have anything to do with anyone expressing an attitude, but the, the, what was laid down for decades continues to matter. So the question, you know, good old pull up by the bootstraps kind of question is, well, how did you get the down payment for your home? And this all makes sense in terms of the decades that unfolded and the, pattern, the patterns of employment, employment discrimination, the patterns of housing discrimination. And you can see basically here that nearly half of whites were able to get help with the down payment on their home and only one in eight African Americans. Now, I guess, you know, someone might try to argue African American parents are stingy or something, but that would be an incredibly ahistorical interpretation, right, that doesn't understand the huge wealth differences between the two groups generated by federal policies and majority white behavior over decades. So of course, and again, this is another thing, if you own your own home, if you, if you, obviously if you can make a larger down payment, your interest rates are lower, which means it costs less over time. You might have to not, you might not have to buy insurance then, you get to save on that if you can make the full down payment. These are all very consequential things that just get passed on from generation to generation or don't get passed on, accumulation and disaccumulation. Okay, I'm about to wrap up here with um, so the last slide here. I've been talking about all the bad news and that's, how, that's what I tend to do, but I feel like we need to, you know, we need to be systematically informed on the bad news, I guess. Or I feel like I need to be. Um, now, Romney, I'm not talking about Mitt Romney. I'm not talking about 2012 or 2008. I'm talking about George Romney, his father, and the remedy that he had for what was called the white noose around the neck of the city, around the black city. And this was not, you know, to only the black power movement using this language. This was in reports coming out of the, the, the riots and the, and, and the rebellions in the 60s and the, the, uh, the reports on that. And George Romney saw it as a huge problem. I'm not sure if he ever actually used the term white noose, but I, I believe he might have. This is what he told the New York Times. And it's just like, it's amazing to think that anyone said this, let alone somebody who's to right of center. Okay, he tells the New York Times, We've got to put an end to the idea of moving to suburban areas and living only among people of the same economic and social class. Now, he wasn't brave enough to use race or anything like that, but that's what he was talking about, you know, um, to a large degree. Now, who's George Romney in 1969? Well, he's the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development in the Nixon administration. Okay, and he's, did anyone ever, did anyone hear the um, NPR story, the This American Life from November 2013? about housing. I strongly recommend it. This is discussed in part here. It's, it's, it's been, so November, I think 22nd, 2013, it's about housing discrimination and there's a little bit of a story about this. Basically, the, the gist of it is Romney said, I don't, you know, he didn't put it this way, but we can put it this way. The federal government has subsidized racial segregation and systematically undercut African American wealth for decades. Now, what can we do about that? We passed the Fair Housing Act, right, which says you can't discriminate, but there was this affirmatively further language in it that was somewhat ambiguous. Romney came to the conclusion to a degree, we need to subsidize racial integration. If we subsidize racial segregation, the solution is not to just stop doing that, the solution is to subsidize racial integration. <laughs> 
And so his plan was to use the power of the federal purse. You know, the suburbs go up, there's sewer lines that need to be built, there's a lot, highways, so on, uh, exits to be built, and so on. And the idea was use the federal purse to more or less coerce these municipalities into integrating racially and also by class as well um, among whites to some degree. Okay, this is 1969. He's in the Nixon administration. Nixon has a very different plan for where he sees things going. He has, as we as it's often called, the Southern strategy, right? He knows that the Republican Party has never had the South at all, ever. And this is their big chance. Okay. It's also a suburban strategy. So it's often called the Southern strategy, but it's really the Southern white strategy, as Joe Fegan point, points out. Uh, I have to. And then there's the suburban strategy. And this idea of using the federal pur purse to forcibly integrate suburbs does not really match <laughs> the idea of appealing to Southern whites and appealing to suburban people in general across the country. Okay, so we can say, mm, bad Rom or bad Nixon, right? Bad behavior on Nixon's part, otherwise something could have been done about this. But I wouldn't really favor that um, interpretation um, because I think that Nixon, it's, I, I would like to look at Nixon and put him in a more systemic and long run historical context here. Okay, and this is actually, I don't want to go on about, this is a lot of what my dissertation's about that I finished a while ago, so I'd be happy in the Q&A to, 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 to go into more detail about it. But the, the, short, the short story is this, okay? I'll keep it as short as I can. Nixon's behavior and the Republican Party's behavior, which was basically to play off whites against blacks. I mean, it's just a matter of record. You go into the memos in the Nixon administration. It was clearly a plan to use busing as, some, as a wedge issue to get white working class voters. Um, he appointed, I mean, in a very kind of individual, overtly racist judges from the South, knowing that the Senate would reject them. He knew they would be rejected by the Senate. And then what did he do? He had a news conference and he said, this, this discrimination against the South is just terrible that all the Southern people must feel awful about this, by which he no doubt was not talking about African-Americans in the South. Okay, so, you know, there, there was a, a clear plan. But this is part of a long, long run process that begins in the early 19th century when the Democratic Party is fully aligned along the lines of white supremacy, North and South. It doesn't crumble until the 1930s with the Great Depression and the movement of African Americans to the North where they could vote thanks to the prior conflict in the Civil War and after, right? So because they could vote, Democrats and Republicans outside the South start competing for African American votes. That's an important part of the civil rights transformation. It's not the, obviously the only part, it's an important part. But eventually things are realigning. African Americans are moving firmly into the Democrats camp and this, the, the Southern whites are certainly not gonna stay in that camp. <laughs> no doubt about it in, in the majorities. And so where the Southern whites had been in the Democratic Party for 140 years, in the name of structural forms of racism, there's a shift in the party coalitions and they become part of the Republican Party at this time. And you know, so Nixon, yeah, Nixon is an actor, but he's part of a, you know, he's a small chapter in a very long book. And he's really just playing a role just to, to a large degree. Okay. Um, so, I, so I've tried to sort of, you know, lay out these, uh, kind of go in deep on housing and neighborhoods and so on. And the, the idea that when we're thinking about structural racism, we got to think about things that are built and stay in pro place unless they're dismantled. And we got to think of policies to dismantle them. Um, and so I hope that as we, as we move to discussion, maybe we can talk more about that. Or whatever we want to talk about, I'll be gl very glad to because I really appreciate the fact that you, uh, you, you had me here tonight. So thank you. <laughs>